Rome, one of the world's greatest civilizations. A ruthless empire ruling over a quarter of the world's population. An empire built on military might and on the Romans' groundbreaking technology. Their engineering skills create some of the most sophisticated architecture the world has ever seen. They luxuriate in heated baths, have flushing toilets, and even double-paned windows. Roman technology was so advanced that some claim we still depend on it today. But is this true? Just how much do we owe to the Romans? Nineteen forty six. A few weeks after the first nuclear bomb tests on Bikini Atoll in the Pacific, French designer Louis Riard creates a new swimsuit. He calls it the Bikini. The world greets it as a daring new innovation. It causes a sensation. Few realize that the Romans had the same idea two thousand years earlier. The Bikini is far from being an isolated example. Many technologies, including strength and concrete, surgical clamps, and sports arenas, are not new ideas at all. The Romans got there first. To reveal the wonders of Roman technology, take a city like New York, vibrant, dynamic, home to millions of people. Like in any 21st century city, the people's lives depend on technology. Central heating. Double-paned windows and bathrooms. Clean water flows from every tap. The city boasts a sophisticated road system, apartments, sports arenas, and high-tech medical facilities. Yet none of these ideas are modern at all. They were developed by the Romans nearly two thousand years ago. In many ways. Without Roman ingenuity, modern life wouldn't be so modern at all. Rome, Italy, around 2,000 years ago, the heart of one of the world's earliest superpowers. From here, the emperors rule over a vast civilization that, at its height in the first century A.D., stretches from Scotland in the north to Egypt in the south. The Roman Empire dominated Europe for over 500 years. From 31 B.C. until its fall in 476 A.D. But for Rome and its empire to survive, the Romans must solve many of the technical problems modern cities face today. In doing so, they lay the foundations for the future. Imagine you're sitting down inside a giant arena, surrounded by thousands of people rooting for their own favorite player. For the passionate fan, it's a matter of life and death. Sounds like a New York Yankees game, but back in Rome at the Colosseum, the atmosphere was very much the same. The difference is that here, a sudden death playoff really does mean sudden death. Archaeologist Janet Delane is an expert in Roman buildings. I think the nearest we can get to imagining what it must have been like to sit in the Colosseum and watch the entertainments is going to a baseball match. The noise, the shouting, the enthusiasm. The one thing that would have been very different would have been the smell, because what you have is real blood. And it's here, Rome, A.D. 80, that the blood flows freely. Let's return to the time of the opening of the Roman Colosseum. It's an elegant building, four stories high, and the Romans don't do anything halfway. Six hundred and twenty feet long, five hundred and ten feet wide, it could house four jumbo jets. It has seats for fifty thousand spectators. The Colosseum is the largest of the lot of the Roman amphitheaters. If you made it an amphitheater that was any bigger. The spectators at the back would lose their optimum view. You wouldn't be able to see anything because they didn't have opera glasses. So it's as big as it could be for people to see. 
Even by modern day standards, this is a big construction project. It takes around nine years, thousands of workers, 100,000 tons of limestone and 300 tons of iron to hold it all together. The inner and exterior walls are constructed from rock, but part of its structural strength comes from their latest and most advanced form of concrete. The Romans did not invent concrete. They borrowed the idea, like many others, from conquered civilizations, like the Etruscans, who mixed lime, water, sand, and small stones to make a lime mortar. It does the job, but don't trust it to hold up your house. It crumbles with age. Roman scientists overcome that problem with a brand new ingredient that makes their concrete stronger. An ingredient forged in the heart of a volcano. Their high-tech ingredient is pozzolana, volcanic ash found on the slopes of Vesuvius in southern Italy. Pozzolana is a mixture of silica, aluminum, and iron oxide cooked in the furnace of a volcano. Its silica is amorphous, meaning without shape, describing how its atoms are loosely bound together. Sand is similarly made up of silica, but its atoms are tightly packed in a crystalline structure which prevents them from reacting with other chemicals. The loosely packed silica atoms in pozzolana react more easily with other ingredients in concrete. Adding pozzolana to lime mortar binds the calcium molecules together. Roman technical wizardry creates a versatile mixture so improved that it even sets underwater. The Romans call their miracle product cementum, hence cement. Even better, by adding stone aggregate to the mixture, they create a strong, adaptable concrete. Delane believes that this breakthrough revolutionized architecture. So the mortar that's made with this volcanic sand can develop strength perhaps five to eight times that of the mortar that is been used before this. Now that means that Roman mortar is much closer to modern mortars that are used in concrete. The Roman engineers use concrete to build the ramped seating and to give the building stability. Supporting the Colosseum's massive structure are 40 feet deep foundations made from cement and stone. The vast oval seating area is supported by a complex system of radial and concentric corridors covered by concrete barrel vaults. Barrel vaults are arches extending in lines to form arcades, which support multiple tiers of the superstructure. Arches are a key element of Roman architecture. The secret is the way arches support vertical loads, largely by what engineers term axial compression. The load is displaced horizontally over the arch to the sides. The weight rests on the keystone at the top of the arch, which then transfers the load through the arch and out to the pillars. What that creates for the Romans is an elaborate honeycomb of arches and passageways. The thousands of thrill-seeking spectators can pour into the amphitheater through 76 entrances a system much like that of modern arenas. Your ticket, your little tessera, had a number, and that took you in to a particular section of seating. The system of entrances and exits is so efficient, you can clear the building in about five minutes. A labyrinth of tunnels and cages under the arena's wooden floor houses hundreds, even thousands, of wild animals and gladiators waiting to fight to the death. The arena was sometimes filled with water to stage mock naval battles, although that was stopped as the water damaged the foundations. Combats in the arena go on for hours, and with the temperatures in Rome commonly reaching 100 degrees, heat exhaustion was a major problem. But the architects come up with an ingenious solution, an awning that could be pulled out over the arena. Only tiny bits of the awning have survived, and no one is exactly certain how it worked. 
One theory is that sailors from the Navy used ropes to pull a series of Roman blinds called a velarium out over the spectators. Covering the Colosseum required an estimated 24 tons of cloth and rope. The development of concrete transformed architecture and is one of the most significant technological breakthroughs that the Romans bequeathed to the world. They have an ability to create quickly to put up buildings on a large scale in what seems to us almost an impossibly short space of time. And also to be very innovative, to see how a, a material like concrete can develop. And they just keep taking it one stage further all the time and you end up with the Pantheon. Yet Roman engineering even surpasses itself with its crowning achievement, the Pantheon. Some experts believe that this is one of the most important buildings the world has ever seen. Roman technology transformed lime mortar into strong, durable concrete. This revolutionized architecture. But having created this new concrete, the Romans then took it to new levels of ingenuity, unsurpassed even to this day. One example of such before-their-time skills can be found in the back streets of Rome. Architect Mark Wilson-Jones believes it to be one of the most important buildings ever built. This is the Pantheon, one of the world's most amazing monuments. <coughs> right. And there we are. It's a spectacle. Built in 118 AD, this is a temple to gods no one now worships, but it still inspires awe and wonder. The first time I saw it is just like it is now. You're uplifted. You feel a kind of joy at um, being in the presence of such an extraordinary thing. When Emperor Hadrian's architects begin designing a new temple to the 12 main gods of Roman religion, they have to come up with an impressive building. They decide upon a vast dome, 142 feet in diameter. By modern standards, that might not sound big, but in the second century, it's a massive undertaking. A solid dome made from uniform Roman concrete would be too heavy to be self-supporting. They need a material light enough and strong enough to span a huge gap. A large dome constantly pushes outward toward its base. So the engineers build 20-foot thick base walls to support and buttress the dome and stabilize the structure. Next is the dome itself. A team of carpenters construct a wooden framework. Masons then covered this with concrete, which they built up in rings from the base. But they risk the structure collapsing once the wooden scaffolding is removed, if they use normal concrete. Well, the important thing for a dome is that it's relatively weak at the top and you want to lighten it. Their technological skills give the Roman masons an ingenious solution. They use lighter and lighter stones within the concrete to reduce the load as the layers get higher. You want to go for the lightest possible the, at the top and the strongest and the heaviest at the bottom. So they were carefully graded in sections from the light at the top, bottom, and the heavy at the bottom. For strength, at the base, they mixed in large lumps of heavy basalt rock. In the middle, knuckle-sized pieces of stone. At the top, they used pumice, a volcanic stone that floats in water. Finally, at the apex, they leave a 30-foot hole called the oculus. This avoids a heavy load at the dome's weakest point and also allows light into the Pantheon's interior. The engineering of the building is incredibly precise. In fact, a sphere based on the curve of the dome would fit almost exactly inside the square building. The Pantheon remains one of the greatest buildings ever constructed. 
it's not until 1300 years later that anyone builds a dome as big as this with the construction of the Duomo in Florence in 1420. Even nearly 2,000 years later, the Pantheon is still the largest unreinforced spherical concrete dome ever built. Its design still influences architecture across the world. Spot the difference. One of these buildings is 2,000 years old. The other is the New York State Supreme Court. Rome's Pantheon is the one on the left. In the 21st century, nearly 50% of the world's population now live in cities and urban areas. But this style of living is not an exclusively modern invention because the Romans got there first. Ancient Rome was a thoroughly modern city with impressive buildings, apartments, and a sophisticated infrastructure to keep it running. The scale of construction impresses archaeologist Janet Delane. I think what's different about the Roman world is the sheer scale of it. A city, the city of Rome, perhaps had a million people. Now you don't get cities of that size again until um, the late 18th, 19th century, at least not in the Western world. When Romans build a new city, they lay it out in a grid system of major and minor roads. And that's exactly the same process that was used in laying out modern cities and still is used in places like New York. Manhattan was laid out very deliberately when the city was founded as a city. New York is renowned for its skyscrapers and giant apartment buildings. But the idea of high-rise living is not a new one. The remains of Ostia, a suburb housing many of Rome's one million citizens, show how Roman architects are the first to solve a problem all town planners face today, lack of space. Roman cities are often built within defensive walls, limiting the room available for building. So like today's cities, the only way to go is up. Even from quite early days in Rome's history, there were multi-story apartment blocks. And this develops into a really fine art. There are buildings that have two, three, four, five floors, and one very famous one that doesn't survive that apparently had eight stories. Once again, the key ingredient is concrete. The architects build strong supporting walls from concrete covered with bricks and tiles. This technique creates apartment buildings nearly 80 feet high. To maintain a rigid structure, they build deep foundations using concrete. The foundations on some of these go down perhaps 10 to 12 feet. So these are very strong structures. But unlike today, where everyone wants the penthouse, in Roman times, the opposite was true. The wealthiest citizens desire the ground apartments. The upper levels are constructed of timber, and they consequently are usually the first to go up in flames. That's also why only the lower two floors of these apartment buildings survive. Not only are their apartments multi-story, inside they are laid out much as you'd see today. The nicest apartments include a kitchen, a living room, and a lavatory. Rome and urban living underwent the same kind of revolution that happened in um, the mid-20th century in, in terms of what we might call mod cons. What amazes Delane is that 2,000 years on from Ostia, the style of living is little changed. It says something about human nature that you can go from somewhere like ancient Rome with its apartments and really sort of high density urban living and end up in New York where they're doing basically the same thing just on an even grander scale. For those of us in the West, luxury might mean pristine bathrooms and satellite TVs. 
to the Romans, it means something that we mostly take for granted. Window glass. I think my favourite thing about the, the Romans in terms of real inventions is window glass. It's only possible because of the invention of glass blowing, which happens about the middle of the first century BC. The Romans create window glass, but then take a further technological step forward. As we all know, if you only have single glazing, the heat goes out as the light comes in. So what do the Romans do? They invent double glazing. Double-paned windows have been standard in modern houses since the 1970s. But in Ostia, there is evidence that the Romans got there before us. Carpenters create a glass support with two slots, about half an inch apart, for the twin glass panes to rest in. This new technology of heat insulation and light rooms is particularly important in another aspect of Roman urban living, baths. In recent times, health clubs and spas have become more and more popular. But once again, the Romans got there first. The Romans are fanatical about cleanliness and bathing and could expect comfortable surroundings with heating technologies still utilized today. Most Roman baths are now merely ruins. But in the ancient town of Bath, in western England, there remains a fully functioning bathhouse still operating with Roman technology. In AD 76, the Romans build a bathhouse around a natural spring that pumps up to 240,000 gallons of hot water every day. Many buildings around the baths are Victorian, dating from around 1897. But the baths themselves and the plumbing used to move the water around are Roman, still working after nearly 2,000 years. The term plumbing comes from the Roman word plumbus for lead. Roman technicians discover a way of fashioning lead pipes by molding beaten sheets of lead around a wooden mold. Until it was confirmed to be a health hazard in the late 20th century, lead pipes were still commonly used for water. The Romans' demand for comfort leads to another notable technological achievement in their bathhouses. Underfloor heating. Floors are built on four-foot-high piers of stacked clay tiles called hypocausts. Strategically located furnaces push out hot air that warms the floor and the hypocausts. Smoke escapes from flues in the walls. After the Romans, this system of heating disappears until it was revived in the 20th century. Roman baths have one other familiar piece of technology. Bathrooms. I'm just entering one of Ostia's public lavatories, and like so much else in the Roman world, this shows a great deal of forethought. Here they have situated the public lavatory next door to the public bath buildings, and that's wonderful because they can use the wastewater from the baths to flush out the whole channel of the um, lavatory system. Privacy is not a big deal in Roman times. This lavatory is shared by men and women, all sitting next to each other without any sort of partition. Cleanliness is important to Romans, so even though they don't have toilet paper, they're able to clean themselves with a wet sponge on a stick. One thing nobody knows is, do they carry their own private sponge or do they share? All these new technologies rely on one vital element. Whether you live in the first or 21st century, it's something you really can't do without. Water. Modern cities require billions of gallons every day. And the growing demand for water inspires the Romans to build their greatest feats of engineering. All modern cities need millions of gallons of water a day. As New York City's population grew to six million in the mid-19th century, so did the need for water. New York was surrounded by springs and reservoirs. 
What it needed was a simple and efficient way of transporting that water to the people. Luckily for New York, the Romans solved this problem over 2,000 years ago. At its peak, the city of Rome needs water for about one million people. But sources of clean water were at least 15 miles away. The Romans need a way of getting water from the springs in the hills into the city. They use gravity. By AD 97, nine aqueducts carry over 250 million gallons of water a day from the mountain springs. Peter Aker studies the importance of water transportation to Rome. The thing that the Romans did differently from the cultures before them, the people before them, was to deliver water in huge quantities to cities and also to build town life around aqueducts. He demonstrates how the system worked with a simple model. We have a model here to show the simple but strict rule of a Roman aqueduct, that water is drawn through the aqueduct by gravity and gravity alone. One end by the source has to be higher than the end at the city, and there has to be a constant inclined plane the entire way down. The water enters the one end of the aqueduct and is drawn by gravity down into the city. The water in one aqueduct is transported over a distance of 30 miles, although the difference in height between the departure and arrival points is a mere 40 feet. The average gradient was around 0.5%. Most of the water flows through tunnels and troughs. But when the Romans come to an obstacle or the ground dips away, they build raised sections to maintain the correct degree of slope and let the water flow freely. The part of an aqueduct that I find most impressive is the visible part, the part that is carried on arches. Only 29 miles of the 260 miles of Rome's aqueducts are above ground. The arches are made from a combination of concrete, stone, and brick cladding. Using this construction technique, the Romans span vast valleys and rivers. The Pont de Gare in France was built around 19 BC. It's nearly 1,000 feet long, crossing 160 feet above the River Gare. It uses 50,400 tons of concrete and stone, and over the course of the span, it drops just half an inch. The water in Roman aqueducts doesn't flow in an open trough on top of the aqueduct, but runs inside a covered channel to protect it from contamination. The remains can still be seen in cross sections of ruins. Using only this system, the aqueducts of Rome supply enough water to fill over 450 Olympic-sized swimming pools every day. The primary destination, the most important destination, would be the fountains in the streets. That was prioritized. People could have easy access to water. Today, New York's 8 million residents need 1 billion gallons of water a day. The brilliance of Roman technology shows in the fact that 95% of New York's water comes from aqueducts still running on principles used in the Roman design. One thing, they went to sources at a distance. Secondly, they brought the water down by gravity feed. It was all brought into Manhattan at a slope. And thirdly, to get it into Manhattan, they had to cross uh, the Harlem River, uh, necessitating a large bridge. In both Rome and New York, the majority of the aqueducts are below ground. It's still possible to explore parts of Rome's ancient virgin aqueduct, hidden below the modern city. Built in 19 AD, the Aqua Virgo carries water from the Salone Springs to the center of Rome, 13 miles away. The aqueduct is mainly underground, and at some points, 
goes 140 feet below the surface. The tunnel averages four feet wide and could carry 2,500 pints a second. This is not an area to be if you're claustrophobic. This aqueduct travels directly to the Baths of Agrippa and served Rome for more than 400 years. Even though sections of the aqueduct no longer work, rainwater still makes its way into the channel. What you have to imagine is this channel filled with some of the clearest and coldest water the Romans knew. It was famous for how clear it was. And it would run maybe three or four feet up this channel here. The aqueduct is cut into the rock or soil and its walls lined with cement. Acre can still see evidence of the Roman engineers' attention to detail. It's fine for that to be rough up top there because the water isn't running full and they don't care about friction. But here, down here, it is smoother indeed in a much more regular surface. They put a special kind of mortar on the section of the aqueduct where the water flowed to reduce the friction and, and improve the flow. A stretch of functioning Roman aqueduct still supplies one of Rome's most famous tourist attractions, the Trevi Fountain. It gushes with water from the same system that once supplied the emperors of Rome. In ancient Rome, the sanitation system created by the Roman engineers cuts the threat of disease, even though they never understood the concept of water-bound contagion. But they did appreciate the importance of health care. And just as now, they had a medical industry with techniques like anesthetics and even plastic surgery. It's Friday night in New York, and hospital emergency rooms are busy. The medics rely on high-tech operating rooms and modern pharmaceutical drugs. Yet many of the ideas and technology they use have their foundations in Roman medicine. As curator of Romano-British collections at the British Museum in London, Ralph Jackson is an expert in Roman surgical technology. I think the thing that most impresses me about Roman medicine is that they achieved so much with so much stacked up against them. There were so many things they couldn't know, and yet the things that they did, they did incredibly well. Like modern medical practice, Roman medicine is split into different specialties, including pharmacists, physicians, and surgeons. They even have anesthesiologists who use opium, henbane, and white mandrake synthesized from flowers and roots. The Romans wouldn't have known it, but henbane and white mandrake are tropane alkaloids. Tropane alkaloids work as anesthetics by blocking the nerve impulses in the brain and neuromuscular junctions. This property leads to the discovery and synthesis of the more potent compound Novocaine, widely used for pain relief. They didn't know what these constituents were, but they knew that these things worked and that you could take a draft and it was perhaps sufficient to put you to sleep. Their understanding of anesthetics may be limited, but their ability to design and make surgical instruments is not. Roman instrumentation lies at the, at the back of all modern instrumentation. And uh, it is spooky sometimes how close uh, that those instruments are. To show just how close Roman instruments are to modern ones, Jackson is showing a replica set of Roman surgical tools to David Rosen at St. Mary's Hospital in London. What is your impression when you see that range of tools? Well, my first impression is it's pretty comprehensive, and, uh, and this is obviously a, a blade or a scalpel. Um, it became what was known as a fleam, which might have been used for bloodletting, but we have uh, very little difference. Comparing the instruments, Rosin is struck by the similarities. My guess, and I may be wrong, this is a retractor to hold things out the way. Now, it's a double-ended retractor, and if I'm right, and you're going to tell me I'm probably wrong, there isn't a lot of difference between a modern retractor for pulling the tissues out the way. But there is one particular Roman tool which appears to be a perfect match for its modern equivalent. This is a smaller retractor, similar to your small one, except 
you were interested to see that uh, we have two different types of retraction. So this is called a cat's paw. Aha, uh -huh, look at that. <laughs> a cat's paw. Now, really very little has is, is changed. I mean, look that's that. virtually the same, isn't, isn't it? Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. Instrument after instrument, the surgeon's tools, although 2,000 years apart, are virtually identical, down to the smallest detail. Absolutely amazed. I mean, virtually no difference at all. And if you think there's 2,000 years difference in time, it's quite amazing. The Romans were using these sophisticated tools to carry out procedures that we would consider very 21st century, including cataract operations, brain surgery, and varicose veins removal. They even carried out plastic surgery. The Romans had a number of operations that we would class as cosmetic. When people got older, the eyelids failed to retract properly. You get a sort of elongation of the upper eyelid. A little sliver of um, uh, tissue was taken out of the upper eyelid and very fine stitching done. Again, a kind of cosmetic surgery. The caesarean section, as we know it, was not performed by the Romans. They used a cruder procedure to remove a baby from a dying mother. This thing about the Caesarean section being um, uh, related to uh, Julius Caesar and uh, being a Roman technique is, uh, is completely wrong. Caesarean section was not practiced in antiquity because if they had done, they knew pretty well knew they would kill the mother. The Romans' ability to cure illness and save lives is matched by just one thing, their awesome ability to slaughter their enemies. To protect the empire, Rome trains the most disciplined and efficient military force the world has ever seen. And to further improve the efficiency of this imperial killing machine, they equip it with the world's most advanced weaponry. Police and armed forces in the 21st century use the latest technology. Bulletproof clothing and riot shields protect the police on our streets while artillery weapons can fire lethal shells miles toward the enemy. 21st century technology inspired by the military machine of first century Rome. Historian Kate Gilliver studies how the Roman army conquered half of the known world. It's the first professional army with soldiers who, who are um, professional soldiers. So the Roman organization, their professionalism, their equipment, um, gives them a huge advantage. 2,000 years ago, the Roman army is the best equipped army in the world. While the architects have mastered the art of manipulating stone and concrete, military engineers have fashioned metal and wood to create devastating weapons of war. The Roman foot soldier's main weapon is a fearsome sword called a gladius, a double-edged blade about 18 inches long with a sharp point. It was used for stabbing and thrusting, rather than slashing. But if a sword could be deadly at close quarters, their spear, called a pilum, could kill from a distance. It can be thrown with lethal accuracy around 100 feet. The pilum's designed basically to kill. It's designed to, to pierce people, to pierce armor, to pierce their shields. The pilum has a six-foot-long wooden shaft topped with a two-foot-long iron shank. The tip of the shank was triangular and would have been difficult to remove once it impaled the enemy. The drawback of any javelin-type weapon is that the enemy may pick it up and throw it back. But Roman military scientists employ the latest metal-making technology to protect their men. The iron tip of the pilum is tempered through rapid heating and cooling, making it hard and strong. The shaft is untempered, leaving it soft. Striking a shield, the pilum's strong tip penetrates, but the soft shaft bends, making it useless for the enemy to throw it back at the Romans. Protecting your soldiers from injury is just as important as arming them for attack. Early Roman soldiers wear chain mail called Lorica Hamata. 
Vertical rows of solid washer-like rings made from bronze or iron are linked to riveted rings that run horizontally. It does have its flaws. It is very heavy, weighing around 33 pounds. And enemy arrows can penetrate between the rings to injure the wearer. Weapons reconstruction expert Ben Giel studies the impact of Roman weapons. So it literally explodes through the links and makes its own way. Roman armorers come up with a far superior form of protection, articulated plate armor called lorica segmentata, made from a series of overlapping iron plates joined together by leather straps. It's as flexible as chainmail, but one third lighter. The protective shoulder and body pads worn by football players work in much the same way. The light segmented sections on the shoulders and chest allow movement, but spread the impact of a heavy blow around the body. The Lorica Segmentata is built to withstand an enemy arrow. Well, it went in only about that far. The arrow may have made a dent, but the armor saves its wearer from serious injury. And if the Romans' weaponry has a modern feel, then so do the tactics they use. Some can still be seen today on the streets of New York. January 31st, 2002. Facing demonstrations against the World Trade Organization, the New York police defend themselves with the latest body armor and high-tech protection. But this use of shields is remarkably similar to something 2,000 years ago. The Roman legions know exactly how to fight heavily armed foes. They use the testudo, Latin for tortoise. Legionnaires bunch together and lock their shields in formation to create a large protective screen. A formation as effective in attack as it is in defense. The soldiers use a large curved shield, which is made from another modern sounding material, plywood. Plywood's very easy to make. You just take um, a few layers of wood and glue them together with the grain at 90 degrees to each other on the different layers. And that provides a protection that's fairly firm, um, but that is still a little bit flexible. And that's how um, they're able to produce these curved shields. Laminating the alternate layers at 90 degrees gives the shield its strength. Drop a marble on a thin sheet of wood and it breaks easily. Put two sheets together with the grains in the same direction and they still break. But cross the grains and the marble bounces off. But it isn't just the foot soldiers who have the high-tech equipment. The Romans can also wheel out the big guns. I think one of the things that impresses me most about Roman military technology is, is the artillery. Few examples of Roman artillery survive, but the Romans left detailed clues as to how to recreate them. Giel is a member of the Ermine Street Guard, Britain's leading Roman reenactment group. He believes their recreations help us to understand how Roman technology worked. Before this was done, nobody really knew how these weapons and how this equipment worked. But just knowing how it was constructed doesn't really tell you how it was used. And, and that's why experimental archaeology like this is very important. This is the scorpion. It fires iron-tipped bolts. It was used in the first stages of attack and during sieges. It pierces armor and kills instantly. It's a bit like a giant crossbow. The rigid bow arms are cranked back, storing the energy in the two vertical skeins made of rope and sinew. Once the bowstring is released, it fires the arrow 1,200 feet 
at incredible speeds. This is the bolt. That will be placed here. When I release the bolt, you'll see that the wooden shaft underneath it also projects forward, and that acts very similar to the barrel of a gun, keeping the bolt as straight as possible when it leaves the weapon. As you can see, it's fully maneuverable. I then aim at a target, and when I'm happy to shoot at them, I will. The Scorpion is a lethally effective weapon. They would have caused devastating injuries. There are skeletons of British people who were probably killed by the Romans when they invaded. There's one guy who had an arrowhead through his spine, another guy who had a catapult bolt through his head, and it went through his skull about here. It must have killed him instantly. Although it's an effective anti-personnel weapon, the Scorpion is of little use in attacking a building. For that, the Romans need something with a bit more punch. The Onager and the Ballista. I think the stone throwers are the most devastating piece of, of, of Roman technology. These pieces of artillery fire large stones at the enemy. During sieges, they propel projectiles so high into the air that they can break down enemy walls. The whizzing noise of the stones strikes terror into Rome's enemies. To increase the fear factor, they're painted black, so they're harder to see. It's very effective physically, but it's also a huge psychological weapon. Um, and enemies whom the Romans are fighting um, are really scared of this stuff. The ballista works like the scorpion, but is bigger and more powerful. It can fire a 60-pound stone forward, or a three-foot bolt around 1,500 feet, allowing the soldiers to stand well away from enemy archers. The speed of the missile is phenomenal, hitting its target at around 115 miles per hour. Anyone sustaining a direct hit would be killed instantly. The Onager uses a different principle. It catapults basketball-sized stones, weighing up to 50 pounds, nearly a thousand feet, using a single arm and sling. The vertical arm is powered by a large horizontal skein of rope, coiled and twisted to create a rotational force. The skein acts like a spring, storing energy to be released on firing. The more powerful the spring, the more powerful the catapult. The Romans use rope made from sinews because it's very springy and gives back an exceptionally high percentage of the energy stored in it. Each Roman legion would carry around 60 pieces of artillery. The combinations of technology and tactics makes the Roman army the premier fighting force in Europe for 500 years and influences military tactics for the next 1,500. We live in a world enhanced by technology, but much of it is inspired by the Romans. Many modern buildings utilize techniques perfected by Roman architects. Without their development of concrete, many of our famous landmarks may never have been built. The Romans pioneered urban living, building their cities on the same principles we still use today. They even solved one of the greatest problems facing all major cities, establishing a fresh water supply by building a vast water transportation system using aqueducts. They were advanced in medical techniques, and they maintained their rule with the most advanced army of its time. Though the Roman Empire fell over 1,500 years ago, much of its technology remains the blueprint for our world today.